Well, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, if you would please open up to the book of Romans, chapter 13. It does seem like in this past election that it just kind of broke down that of all the people that voted, it seems like half of them won and the other half lost. Of all the people that voted, it seems like one half of them are happy and the other half are really mad. Well, whether you're happy or mad, whether you won or whether you lost, this morning as we continue in our study of the book of Romans, we're going to talk about no matter what, we're going to talk about how to live the rest of your life. It's time to, to get on with our lives. And, and so this morning, we're going to look at how to live the rest of your life. We're looking at Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. Now, in this uh, small six, verse, six verses of, of text that we're going to look at this morning, Paul's really talking about how to make the rest of your life, no matter how long that is, if it's five weeks, five months, or 50 years, no matter how long we have, Paul says, I want you to learn how to make the rest of your life the best of your life. I think we're all ready for that. What we've been through in the year 2020, we're, we're ready to move forward. And we're ready to make the rest of our life even better than what it's been in the past. So let's read our text, Romans chapter 8. Um, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 8 and, and going to verse 14. Reading from the New International Version. And Paul says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covenant, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, love does, does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray now, God, that through your Holy Spirit working in us, you will give us an understanding and insight, Lord, not only to be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. God, help us to understand and help us to apply this word to our lives. Let this word change us and transform us. Let this word shape us and form us into the people that you want us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage, Paul prescribes six very practical actions on how to make the most of your time that God has given you. So let's jump right in. Number one on your outline is this. Pay up. Pay up. Don't overextend your debt. The first sentence, the first part of the sentence in verse 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding. So now in the Greek language, the language that the New Testament was written in, in Greek, it literally says, stop continuing to owe. So what he means is don't borrow something and then not pay it back. Don't, don't borrow what you can't pay back. That's really practical advice, right? Don't borrow something if you can't pay it back. That's, that's what he's saying here. Don't take on more debt than, than what you can handle. Now, listen to this. This is important. The Bible does not say that borrowing money is wrong. It's not wrong to borrow money. But it's wrong if you borrow money and you don't pay it back. Psalm 37, 21 says this. It says that the wicked borrow and do not pay back, but the righteous give generously. Now, if it was a sin to, to borrow, why would the righteous give generously? 
It's not a sin to borrow money. It's a sin to, to not pay it back. Pay your debts. It's not wrong to have a, a mortgage on your home or your business or, or an auto loan for your vehicles. Just borrow as much as what you can pay back. That's all that it's saying. So number one, pay up. If you want to have the best of your life for the rest of your life, pay up. Number two, build up. Love everybody. It says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Build up, love everybody. That's the second thing that you ought to do if you want to make uh, the best out of the rest of your life. Now, it's easy to love people who are like you. It's easy to love lovely people. But we are called to love one another. In the Greek, the word another, there's, there's two different words for another. And one of the Greek words for another means another of the same kind. You know, love one another, people that are like you. There's another Greek word used for another. And that one means another of a different kind. Guess which word is used here in this Bible verse? It's the ones who are different. We are called to love people who are different than us, which is good because we're a pretty different bunch of people, if I do say so. <laughs> Speaking for me and for you, we're, well, you know, we're a pretty unique group. We're a pretty unique bunch of people. And, and we're to love each other in all of our uniqueness, in all of our differences. And guess what? Then there's a world out there that's different than we are. <laughs> So we're not only to love one another here, um, but we're to love one another out there. Um, we're to love people from different political parties. <gasps> Gasp. <laughs> <laughs> we're to love people who think differently than we do. We're, we're called to love people who look different than we do. Different skin color, different ethnicity, different background, <clears throat> um, different upbringings, different experiences. Uh, you know, some people, they'll look up and they'll say, the sky is green. You say, no, it's blue. They say, no, it's green. You, you just don't see things the same way. And yet we're called to love everybody, the green sky people and the blue sky people. We're just called to love one another. If you're a Christian, you're obligated to love one another. Paul says that there is a debt that we will never be finished paying, and it's not a financial debt, but it's our debt as believers in Christ to love one another. God first loved us, and he showed us the full extent of his love. In this, while we were yet still sinners, he sent Christ to die for our sins. So God definitely loved us first, and then he, Jesus said, hey, a new command I give you. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. So this is a very important biblical principle that Christians are known by their love. This is how people will know us as believers in Christ, that we love one another and we love people that are different than us. So that's the ongoing debt that we will have. The ongoing debt that we'll never be able to pay off. As long as we live, we're going to keep paying on that debt to love one another. Now, look at the next part of the passage, verses um, 9 to uh, 10. It says, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So now you're thinking to yourself, how do I show people that are different than I am? How do I show them love? How do I demonstrate my love? How do I show it to them? Well, Paul in this passage <clears throat> uses as an example some of the Ten Commandments. And so he says, hey, the, the commandments, for example, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't, don't covet. At its most basic root, if I love you, I'm not going to kill you. If I love you, I'm not going to steal your car or cover your car or your nice things. I'm not going to steal your spouse. You know, so at the very root level, look at the Ten Commandments. And it says that as we obey the Ten Commandments, as we follow the commandments of God, we're showing love to our fellow man. 
The commandments themselves demonstrate that there are, there are things that, that we have rights to own. We have rights. We have rights to private property. We have rights to things. Right? And so we can show other people love by not infringing on their rights. By not taking things that don't belong to us, but belong to them. That's one of the ways that Paul says. That's a practical way that you can show your love by following the, the Ten Commandments. By uh, respecting people, respecting their rights. Especially when they're different from you. Respect them, love them, especially when they're different than you are. So Paul says, pay up. Don't have debts that you can't afford to pay back. Build up. Love other people. The number three, wake up! <laughs> wake up, everybody! Wake up! The time is short. We need to get going. Verse 11 says this, and do this understanding the present time. Do what? Well, don't take on more debt than what you can pay back. Love other people. Respect other people. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I know that when you first believe in Christ, you're saved. But there will come a time when we leave these earthly bodies. When we're clothed with a spiritual body, we leave this earth and we go on to glory. We go on to heaven. And that time of our salvation, it's nearer today than it was back when we got saved. Let me just ask you a question. This is just for fun. How do you wake up in the morning? Like when the sun comes up, I've been sleeping downstairs in our living room in a hospital bed. There's no shades on the windows. There's four windows in that big room. And when it starts to get late light, I wake up. Did anybody anybody here wake up at the first light? Crack, crack of dawn, you're just kind of, your body's kind of getting awake. I'm, so, I'm sorry for you. I'm really sorry that you're that way. Because sometimes I'm like, I just want to sleep longer, but I'm awake. Oh, no. How many, how many of you have the, so eh, 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 as soon as the alarm goes off, how do, as the alarm goes off, you're up, you're ready to go. Let me see. Yeah, some, some of you guys. Okay, how about, how about this? How about who relates to this one? Eh, eh, eh. Hit the snooze bar. <laughs> okay, guilty confessions. How many of you set your alarm like, an hour, an hour earlier than you need to get up, and you snooze bar like twenty times. Like, oh yeah, see, I'm, yeah. If if I was in my bedroom, I might be more prone to be more apt to be like that. So, no, but now here, so here, we all have different ways of waking up. Paul saying, "Hey, wake up!" But he's not talking about waking up from our sleep. He's talking about spiritual laziness. But have you noticed this? That that the way you wake up, God usually puts you together with different people. So if you're if you're like give me five more minutes, you know you're you're married to that person who's up before the sun even comes up. <laughs> God just seems to put opposites together. But uh, when Paul tells us to wake up, it's not from our physical sleep. He's he's talking about spiritual laziness. We got to get going. We got to we got to get in gear because time is short. The third principle is basically this. It's make the most of every opportunity that God has given you. Don't take a moment, not even a moment of the day for granted. You know what I just heard, and it's really kind of sad, that um, in the year 2020, Barna Research, it's a, a research group, and I know research groups, people who take polls, don't have a lot of credibility in our country right now. But uh, the Barna Group is a, a Christian company that doesn't poll on political issues. They poll on Christian issues, issues dealing with Christianity, and they've found that only 8% of American Christians read their Bibles every day. Only 8%. And, and this is in a year where we've got more time on our hands, and yet less of us are reading God's Word, getting into God's Word every day. In 2019, it was 13%. In 2019, and that, like neither of those are great numbers to like, you know, say, hey, we're doing a great job, American Christians. 13% of us are reading God's word every day. And now in this year, it's even less. It's, it's 8% of Christians are reading God's word. So like, I think about that. I think about that. 
I was, I was looking forward to inviting some people over to our house in January. And uh, you know what? Uh, whenever it comes out on Netflix, if it, if it comes out all together, it'll be out all together. If it's just a week at a time, it'll be a week at a time. But, man, I'm looking forward to the new season of Cobra Kai. I thought, you know what? I'm going to invite some people to the church to come to my house. We're going to have a Cobra Kai party. It's going to be the Chamberlain Dojo. And uh, let's watch uh, Ralph Macchio as a 51-year-old because I'm digging that. You know, I'm getting close to that age. So uh, let's let's go back to the karate kid days of the 80s and uh, see those guys all grown up. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think, well, like that was a part of our problem. We started watching so much TV and filled our, our mind and our bodies and our time that we have with so much other stuff. We were just kind of all the way full before we got to open up the Bible. <clears throat> I still might invite some of you to my dojo for Cobra Kai, but I'm going to ask you if you read the Bible before you come over to watch the TV show. Maybe we'll make a little compromise there. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says, that's why it said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Man, who's got a testimony about that? The days are evil. We look around in our country. We look around in the world. And we see time and time again, example and example again, that the days are evil. Our world just seems like it is so rapidly changed. What's right is now wrong. What used to be wrong is now considered right. It seems like we're in an alternate universe and everything is just upside down from how we remember it. We're, we're literally in a cultural revolution, and we have been for some time. But we weren't awake. We've been sleeping. We've been sleeping in the light. We've been just fat on how good it is in America. There was no religious persecution. You can find a lot of examples of that now. There's always been religious persecution across the world. There's always been people who've been martyred for their faith, people who've been killed because of their belief in Christ. But that wasn't in America. But now more and more, we're seeing real bad examples of religious persecution in America. We don't have the luxury of just sleeping through the cultural revolution that's happening. We need to be in God's word. We need to know God's word because we need to know what up is. We need to know true north. We need to know the proper standard. The standards today, they change. But God's word never changes. God's word is the standard for us to follow. So we have to be awake. We have to be alert. We have to be in God's word the time is short. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. We're getting closer and closer. And the Bible does say that Christ is coming back to this earth again. The Bible says that the rapture will happen when those who believe in Christ will be caught up in the air. And will be together with Christ. We'll be with him in paradise. And then literally the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And I'm praying in, in just my own theological belief. I believe that we will be raptured before the worst of the end times. We'll be together with Christ. We'll, we will avoid uh, the, the, the judgment, the wrath that's coming on this earth if, if we're believers in Christ. And the time is getting closer and closer. We just we don't know when it is, but the Lord is coming. So let's not waste the time that we have left. Now, in light of this short time, in light of Christ coming back, Paul says, hey, pay up. 
Don't take on more debt than you can pay back. Build up by loving people. You want the country to get better? Love people. Love people that are different than you. You want to bridge the divide? Just show love. Pay up. Build up. Wake up. The time is short. The number four, gear up. Gear up and get prepared for battle. So in uh, verse 12, Paul gives us the analogy of an army. He says, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Folks, if you don't know it, get prepared for battle. You're in a war. Maybe some of you didn't know that, but the moment that you became a Christian, the moment that you became a believer in Christ, you are engaged in a spiritual battle. It's very important to realize that uh, we struggle every day for our own spiritual growth. We, we struggle every day with temptation. We struggle every day to do what we know is right or to not do what we know is wrong. Every day is a battle. Every day we don't have our act together. Guess what? It's not only a battle for our own spiritual growth and development, but it's a battle for the salvation and the souls of people that are around us. Family members that aren't saved. Friends that, that aren't saved. What's our witness? Um, when people look at us, do they see our Christianity shining through? Um, or, or do they see that we're just like everybody else in the world? Are we, are we being a change agent? Like last week, we talked about salt and light and how the salt penetrates to add flavor and it preserves. Are we adding flavor to the world? Are we preserving the world? Are we keeping the world from, from going rotten? Man, we're in a battle. We've moved from salt and light to put on the armor of God. Because the devil's out there and he's throwing darts and arrows at you. And he wants to trip you up. He doesn't want you to grow as a believer. He doesn't want your friends or family members to be influenced in a positive way by, by your life and your faith and your actions. So we need to put on armor so we can stand up from those attacks from the devil. Paul says it like this in Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about the armor of God. And he's very specific. He says in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. I think I could probably go five weeks on that passage. <laughs> That's a fun one to break down and, and look at that armor and what that is and, and how we're to be prepared and how we're to be girded up. So when we're in the battle, the spiritual battle that this life is, we can stand firm with the full armor of God. But for now, let's just say this. How do we put on that armor? We put it on by reading God's word. Not just reading God's word, but studying it. Memorizing it. Man, I, I don't do a good job with that. I can do better at memorizing God's word. Meditating on it. Do you know what meditating on God's word is? It just means that you, you rehearse it over and over in your mind. 
meditation got this bad rap, you know, this Eastern philosophy that you, you clear your mind of everything. Um, and you think about nothing. Um, you can't think about nothing. That, that was a double negative. That was not proper grammar. <laughs> um, we need to think about what is right, what is true. If anything is, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, we're to think about those things. We're to think about God's word. We're to meditate on God's word. Play it over again in your mind, over and over again. If you watch football this afternoon and they show you that instant replay, man, put the instant replay of God's word in your mind and rewind it and slow it down and look at it from different angles and see the same thing over and over again. And you realize that you see it differently. There's more and more wisdom and knowledge inside of God's word. We can't exhaust it. Play it again. Rewind it. Meditate on it. That's how we put on the armor of God. By getting in God's word. So pay up. Build up. Wake up. Gear up. Number five, clean up. Clean up and maintain a pure lifestyle. Verse 13 says this. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Paul gives us six things here, but they come in pairs. So this is what it means to live a clean life. Now, I didn't give you any extra room on your outline, but if you want to squeeze this in, I want you to think about those six items, but think about them in pairs. And so the, the first pair is this. Not in orgies or getting drunk. No orgies or drunkenness. So the first thing is this. Just write down self-control. So how do we live a clean life? It's a life of self-control. Now, orgies, we, we tend to think of that today as like these sex parties and getting together, a bunch of people getting together to have sex. Orgies are not just about having sex. I mean, they can be. But in, in biblical times, they had, they had food orgies. I think we're going to do that at Thanksgiving, whether our families get together or don't get together. But we're getting together. We're indulging in food. And, and so back in Bible times, they had food orgies. They had, they had drug orgies. And so what he's saying here, a little life of self-control. He's talking about alcohol abuse. He's talking about drug abuse. And so, you know, to have a clean life, just have some self-control. Just have some self-control. You know, there's nothing wrong with Briar's mint chocolate chip ice cream. There's something wrong when you eat the whole container all at once. Especially when you can't walk to burn off any calories. <laughs> like moderation, just live a life of self-control. So first thing he's talking about is, is orgies and drunkenness. Just, it's just overindulgence is what he's talking about. So self-control. Second thing is, is moral purity. So he says, stay away. And what he says here is sexual immorality and debauchery. Folks, sexual immorality and debauchery is all around us. You can't watch a TV show without seeing it. You can't read a book without, you know, sex that's outside of God's parameters. Sex is great. God created it. It's good. Within his parameters. And he says, so live a life of moral purity. Sometimes we, we pat ourselves on the back. We say, well, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're good. We're not, we're not doing that sexually immoral stuff. But we're watching it on TV. Debauchery. You know what debauchery is? It's, it's, it's losing your ability to blush. We used to blush in America. People have done the same thing since the time of Adam and Eve. People have always done the same things. There's no new sins. All the same sins back then are the same sins we're doing now. But in the good old days, we used to hide them. <laughs> and what debauchery is, debauchery is putting the sin out there and celebrating it. It's being proud of our sins. Being bold in our sins. Telling everybody about our sins. You know what? My sins aren't that bad. That's what debauchery is. It's celebrating. We have parades and we march down the street celebrating our our immoral, our immorality. And it shouldn't be like that. It 
Lastly, harmony and love. I think it's interesting that this is the the last group of of sins. Um, We should be living a life of harmony and love. But it it says, you know, he talks about orgies and drunkenness. Well, that's bad. Sexual immorality, debauchery. Well, that's bad. And then he says, dissension and jealousy. Well, shoot, folks, those are the respectable sins. Dissension and jealousy, that's nothing. Well, no, it's not nothing. Paul puts that in the same list. Dissension and jealousy is right in the same category as orgies and drunkenness, sexual immorality and debauchery. Right there with it is dissension and jealousy. God says immorality is immorality. It's just as wrong to stir up fights and arguments in the body of Christ. It's just as wrong to to talk behind people's backs. It's just as wrong to spread rumors. It's just as wrong to be jealous of of other people because they have more than you. Those things are just as wrong in the body of Christ than orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery. It's just as wrong to have dissension and jealousy in the body of Christ. Damaging the unity of the church by spreading rumors or negative talk is serious sin business. Lastly, number six, dress up. Dress up. Clothe yourself with Christ. Rather than orgies and drunkenness, sexual immorality and debauchery, dissension and jealousy, instead of those, verse 14 says, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Dress up, clothe yourselves with Christ. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind, renew your thoughts, change what you think about. Change the way you think. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you read God's word, when you study God's word, when you meditate on God's word, it changes the way you think. And that's so important because the way you think determines how you feel. And how you feel determines how you act. And so many times when we look at our lives, we want to change our actions. We want to change the external things. But Paul's saying, start with the internal. If you're changing on the inside, it's going to automatically change what happens on the outside. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, Paul gives us an additional insight. He says this, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Let me just pause right there. This is what I'm talking about. The way you think determines the way you feel. And your feelings determine your actions. Every emotional eater knows this. When you feel bad about yourself, you comfort yourself with a bowl of ice cream. Or a donut or a candy bar. Some people are different. Not everybody's like that. Some people, when they feel bad about themselves, they go shopping. Because that makes them feel better. Some people are different. People, when they feel bad about themselves, they they go back to that addiction. See, we all have different ways of coping, but it, it, it so much is determined about how we think. How we think determines how we feel, and how we feel determines what we do next. And what we put into our minds is what comes out of our minds. So we need to be careful. That's what he's saying here. 
Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your minds. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In uh, Philippians 2.5, Paul tells us to put on the mind of Christ. That's what he's talking about here. Clothe yourself with the Lord. So here's the, the last two verses. They, they say this. This is our text. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and in drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, this, these are six actions that Paul gives us to make the most of our time, to make the best of the rest of our lives. These are six things that we can do starting today and moving forward to make the best of our lives possible. But keep this in mind. This is not just Paul telling us what we have to do. You can't tell me what to do. You don't know how I feel. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that from my kids. Paul's not just giving us a lecture. He's not being our dad and telling us what we have to do. This is something that Paul did. This is how he lived his life. And he was one of the greatest Christian leaders in the history of the world. So let's be like that. Let's be Christian leaders in our world. Let's change our world. Let's influence our people. Let's make the best of our lives. So let's follow this example. So let, I just, how we close right here, I just want us to take a, a little personal time of evaluation and, and look at these six action steps. Just do a little evaluation. It's between you and God. We don't have any guarantees of, of today, tomorrow, a month, a year, 10 years, 50 years. We don't know when our time is up. We don't know when Christ is coming back. So Paul gives us a list of six things that, that uh, we need to do. We need to wake up and realize the time is brief. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for making it clear through the power of your Holy Spirit, which helps us to understand your word. God, help us not just to be hearers today, but help us to be doers of your word. God, it doesn't matter how much time we have left. We, we want the rest of our lives to be the best that they can be. So, God, from what we learned today, we ask you to help us in these things. God, help us not to, to overextend ourselves in debt. God, when we're so consumed with, with bills, we, we lose our focus on serving others and doing things for other people. God, help us to love others, especially those that are different than us. God, help us to make the most of every opportunity to redeem the time. God, help us to be aware of spiritual doors that you open. That we could share our faith with other people. That at least we could invite others to come to church. That our lives could be a, a testimony that they see something different in us. Something about us that's different. How we cope with things. How we respond to things. God, let other people see your light inside of us. And help us to make the most of every opportunity to share you with others. Lord, help us to gear up to realize that we're in a battle. Help us to put on your armor to protect us and strengthen us against the, the flaming darts of the evil one who wants to trip us up. God, help us to stand and to stand firm. Help us to put on your armor your spiritual armor, help us to be in your word, God. 
Father, help us to maintain a pure lifestyle. Help us to have a lifestyle that, that demonstrates self-control and, and moral purity. Help us to live a life of, of love and harmony. God, transform the way we think. Renew our minds in Christ Jesus. Draw us into times where we long to read your word. Help us to be disciplined every day, if not just picking up a copy of the daily bread. Starting off every day with a little quiet time, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of your word. God, draw us into a deeper season of prayer and more time in your word. The more time we spend with you, the more that it will change the way we think. And the more that you transform us and change the way we think, the better we're going to feel about ourselves and the differently we're going to live so much better. God, help us to to learn more about you so we can think like you and, and see life the way that you see it. Father God, thank you so much for our church family. The opportunity that we have to love one another, to, to pray for one another, to care for one another. Lord, thank you for this church family. Encourage us and let us go out into the world to let our light shine. Help us truly to make the rest of our lives the best of our lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name. All of God's children said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Folks, thank you for your faithfulness.